Do you remember the near industrial revolution of Song China in the 11th and 12th centuries CE? We saw how in an environment that was suddenly more commercialized, more competitive than in the past, innovation suddenly increased. And a huge amount of innovation occurred in agriculture, in industry, in economic organization and so on. But then what happened was that it all fell away again from the end of the 13th in the 14th centuries. What made the modern revolution so different is that instead of dying away like this, the process of innovation continued and spread around the entire world. And it's still continuing today, more than two centuries later. Now, why the difference between the outcomes of these two periods of very rapid, almost explosive growth? Partly the difference is that the world of the 19th century was so much more integrated and interconnected than the world of the 12th century. Remember, the world of the 12th century, the world of Song China, was still a world divided into four main world zones, and even connections between the different parts of Eurasia, between, say, China and the Mediterranean, were slow. It took several centuries for Chinese innovations to diffuse through Eurasia. Now we look at this later industrial revolution. How rapidly did the changes we have observed during the British Industrial Revolution spread to other parts of the world? And how great was their impact? Well, the short answer is that within just two centuries, industrialization had transformed the entire world for better or worse. No earlier transformation in human history had ever been so rapid or so far reaching. Just remember, in the Paleolithic era, the first era of human history, it took humans almost 200,000 years to spread around the entire world. So what I, what I want to do in this lecture is to describe the impact of industrialization up to about 1900. To get a clear overview of these changes, it might help to think of four main waves of change before 1900. The real processes, of course, were much more intricate, much more complicated. But this idea of four main waves provides a very helpful broad sketch of the main changes. So we'll, we'll, we'll survey in each of these waves the region it affected, the period it occurred, and the distinctive technologies associated with that wave. So let's begin with the first of these four waves, wave one. The first wave begins in the late 18th century, and we described some aspects of it in the previous lecture. It mainly affected Britain. It also touched the western edge of Europe, and in some senses touched even the eastern seaboard of the United States. New technologies in this wave included a much more productive agrarian sector, improved steam engines, steam engines that were now efficient enough to be taken up widely in other, other industries, and therefore allowed humans to tap into the immense reserves of energy stored in fossil fuels. The mechanization of cotton textile production and increased production of coal and iron. And we saw also that changes occurred in a large number of other sectors as well. But these are the main sectors, the ones where the changes are most striking. The cotton gin, incidentally, cotton gin or engine, was a particularly important American contribution to this phase. Invented by Eli Whitney in 1793, it was a mechanical device for separating cotton seeds from cotton fibers. Now here, in this case, we can measure the resulting increase in productivity very easily. It now took one person to do what had previously taken 50 people working by hand. Unfortunately, as with many of these innovations, the initial impact of this was simply to increase the scale of sweated labor, or in the case of the states, of slavery. Now, wave two. Wave two took place in the early 19th century. Innovation accelerated in many parts of Western Europe, including Belgium, France, and Germany, 
and also along the eastern seaboard of the newly independent United States. Uh, technological changes in the second wave included the increased use of steam engines in manufacturing and the spread of railways and steamships. Railways spread rapidly in Europe and in the USA. The first commercial steamship was a paddleship designed by Robert Fulton, which traveled between New York and Albany beginning in 1807. It used a Watt steam engine. The first ocean-going steamship was called the Great Western. It was designed by the great British designer Isambard Kingdom Brunel, and it was launched in 1837. It crossed to New York the next year. In 1843, he launched another steamship known as the Great Britain. This was the first large iron ship in the world and the first to use a screw propeller. Its maiden voyage to New York took 14 days. It had, a, it had an interesting subsequent history. It ended its days as a coal bunker on the Falkland Islands, but then in 1970 it was finally refloated, towed to England, and it's now been renovated as a museum that can be seen in Bristol. Steam transportation was immensely important. It speeded up commercial exchanges and it cut transportation costs, which stimulated commerce and manufacturing. Now, this was particularly true in very large countries such as the USA or Canada, where cheaper land transport had a revolutionary impact on commerce in general. By 1917, there were about one million miles of railways throughout the world, and about one third of them were in North America. Now, why was the railway so revolutionary? Well, here's one way of looking at it. Throughout the agrarian era, transportation by land had been slower and more expensive than transportation by sea. That explains, incidentally, why regions such as the Mediterranean, where a lot of exchanges could take place by sea, or those connected by great river systems such as Egypt and Mesopotamia, flourished economically. It's at least one of the important factors in their economic growth. With the railway, for the first time in human history, transportation by land became as cheap and as rapid as transportation by sea. And this provided a massive stimulus for economic development, particularly in regions such as North America, where most transportation had to be by land. So that's the second wave and it's dominated by railways. The third wave, we can assign roughly speaking to the middle of the 19th century. It dominates the middle decades of the 19th century. Industrialization accelerates within Europe, particularly, particularly within Germany. And Germany, since the 20s, has been united economically within a common custom zone, the Zollverein. And by 19, 1871, it would also be united politically. Change is also rapid in the eastern USA. Technological innovations in this period include the industrial production of chemicals such as dyes and artificial fertilizers, which revolutionized agriculture. Fertilizers would be immensely important in supporting, in supplying food to the rapidly growing populations of the modern era. And the ability to produce artificial fertilizers greatly cheapened the use of fertilizers. Steel making was made more effective with the introduction of the Bessemer process. And this is the era also in which the industrial use of electricity began. Domestic lighting began to revolutionize patterns of work and leisure by lighting up the night. All previous forms of lighting had severe limitations Electricity could provide a sort of brightness that had no parallel elsewhere and, and, for some purposes, obliterate the distinction between day and night. So the humble light bulb transformed life and transformed urban life in particular. Its inventor was, of course, Thomas Edison. Edison, Edison is remarkable. He took out patents on more than a thousand inventions, and these included the light bulb and also the phonograph and the first motion picture camera. Warfare was revolutionized in this period. 
Railways made it possible to transport large numbers of troops and equipment and material. And new and more powerful weapons, such as machine guns, began to greatly increase the killing power of those who were armed with them. So the American Civil War is widely regarded as the first major war of the Industrial Era. The telegraph and telephone revolutionized communications. Now today it's all too easy to take for granted this revolution in communications. But we need to remind ourselves what a strange phenomenon it was. The idea of instantaneous communication over huge distances transformed the possibilities for what we have called in this course collective learning. The first forms, the telegraph and early telephones, transmitted messages along electric cables. The electrical telegraph was invented in Britain in 1837 and the Morse code uh, at the same time in the States. Within just 25 years, most of the world was linked by telegraph communication. The telephone was invented in 1876 by Alexander Bell, but its reach would soon be extended by improvements introduced by the ubiquitous Thomas Edison, who in 1878 made a call from New York to Philadelphia. But it was possible to communicate even without without cables, and this was a possibility explored by an Italian, Giulielmo Marconi. By 1895, he had found he could send a message over a few kilometers without wires, and on December the 12th, 1901, he sent the first wireless transmission across the Atlantic. Now, while we're on the subject of modern communications, here's an anecdote about the wonder of instantaneous broadcasting around the world. Chronologically, it belongs strictly to a later period, but I, I can't resist a cricket story, and I promise it's the only one in this course. International cricket matches are called test matches, and they began to be broadcast live in the 1920s. Now, you have to understand that broadcasting cricket was a challenge because a test match can last five days, and for much of that period, particularly if there's bad weather, not much is happening. In the 1940s, test matches began to be broadcast around the world. And Australian commentators began to commentate on test matches proceeding, going on, on, on in Britain. And what they, what they did was they used to receive streams of cables from Britain detailing what, ha what happened to each ball. They would sit in their studios and they would tell the story as if they were watching the match themselves, complete with vivid, sometimes largely imaginary details about the scene. And they'd also use special sound effects, such as tapping the microphone to simulate the stand, sound of a bat hitting a ball. The Australian audiences, I'm told, were spellbound. Now, that little story, I hope, just is, is a reminder of how recent these changes are and how remarkable they are. Now, let's move on to the fourth wave, the late 19th century. Strictly, we should probably say the late 19th century and early 20th century. The fourth wave dominated that period and in this period industrialization we can say spreads for example it spreads to russia and japan and it spreads west within the united states and canada in russia railway building particularly the building of the trans-siberian railroad which was completed in 1904 and ran from moscow to the pacific coast stimulated iron production and manufacturing, and it made it possible to export grain more cheaply and also stimulated internal trade. Now this is an example of one of the early phases of state-driven industrialization. The initiative came largely from the state, so did much of, the much of the initial financing. This is the age when a second fossil fuel, oil, begins to be used. The oil age launched a second phase of the fossil fuels revolution with the invention of the internal combustion engine in the late 19th century. The Wright brothers showed how, how you could use an engine to drive a heavier than air plane in 1903. This is again an, an idea that we take for granted but we need to remind ourselves how remarkable it is. The idea that humans might one day routinely fly around the world would have seemed the purest fantasy just a few centuries earlier. Today, 
If you go to Kitty Hawk, you can see a modern replica of their plane, which can, in fact, fly. It's, it's, it's a beautiful machine. I, I've seen it myself. In 1913, Henry Ford produced the first Model T Ford, which pioneered mass production for a new mass consumer market, making the internal combustion engine and the car not just elite products, but products aimed at a much, much larger market, almost like textiles. Now, I've described the four main phases. The next thing I want to do is describe how these changes, which I've described mainly in economic terms, began to affect other sectors of life. And the first area I want to look at is government. How did these changes affect government? Now, the short answer is that they were transformative. We use the same word government for modern governments and those of the agrarian era, but, but frankly, these are utterly different beasts. Economic changes and rising productivity transformed the power and the very nature of government and the state during this era. Governments acquired new forms of power, but they also found that they faced new and much more complex challenges than had been faced by the relatively much simpler tribute-taking states of the, of the later agrarian era. War was a major driver of change. With increasing production, states from the 18th and early 19th centuries found that they had to become much more effective at mobilizing national resources, both of manpower and materials. In fact, increasingly, success in war meant success in mobilizing all the resources of your economy. The armies of revolutionary France pioneered in the challenge of raising large citizen armies using the appeal of nationalism. And nationalism was to become immensely important in the modern era. It was a way of creating what the sociologist Benedict and Anderson called an imagined community to which all citizens of a particular state were encouraged to think of themselves as belonging so that they would commit themselves to the support of that community and, if necessary, die for it. But nationalism wouldn't work if states treated their citizens in the fundamentally exploitative way which was characteristic of most tribute-taking governments. If you want your citizens to actually support you as a, as a government, as a state, you have to give them a greater sense of ownership of society. And this was a, cha a change that was achieved in part through the introduction of more democratic methods of rule, of which perhaps the most important is the use of elections. Industrialising governments in general found that to mobilise support from below, from a population that was now very different from the peasant populations of the later agrarian era, it was more mobile, it was more urbanised, it was generally better educated, and it was not self-sufficient. In order to gain support from these populations, they had to provide new services. And these services included policing. And you see the introduction of the first modern police systems in France during the French Revolution. It involved the provision of more health services and also of mass education. These were services that hardly any agrarian era states had, had seriously thought of providing. There's another feature of this. The power of modern governments depended increasingly on economic growth. So they became increasingly economic managers rather than just takers of wealth. To survive, they had to spend a lot of effort and a lot of time worrying about how to stimulate growth, how to create environments in which commerce could flourish, how to create legal systems that pr protected entrepreneurship, how to create banking systems that created stable financial systems. Now, this alone, this change alone, the fact that governments became managers rather than simply coercers and tribute takers was revolutionary. Remember Prince Vladimir of Kiev, who saw military power as the key to acquiring wealth. He saw coercion as the key to getting wealth. In the modern era, essentially, the roles have been reversed. Increasingly, for modern states, the fundamental rule is wealth gives you power. A wealthy 
highly productive economy is the key to military power. So success for a state in the modern era means building economic growth. There's another way in which the role of government was bound to increase in societies in which most people were wage earners. And this is because wage earners, unlike independent peasants who are largely self-sufficient, depend on the provision of basic services such as markets. To survive as a wage earner, you have to find employment. There have to be markets on which you can buy goods and produce. Uh, there have to be legal systems that protect the conditions of employment and so on. And inevitably, what this meant was that governments became more involved in the day-to-day -day life of most of their citizens. To put it very crudely, whereas in the late agrarian era, 80 to 90 percent of the population could be left most of the time just to get on with it. Peasants didn't need the state to interfere. In the modern era, most of the population needs the services that states provide. So states had to protect property, they had to maintain law, law and order, they had to ensure stable currencies. To do that, they needed increasing information about their populations, about the health, the education, and the incomes of the populations they ruled. So to summarize some of these political changes, the rules of political success have changed in the modern era. Larger, more mobile, and better educated societies had to be managed rather than simply coerced. In the Atlantic hub zone, the beginnings of these changes were already evident in the political revolutions of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. This is the era described famously by the American historian R. R. Palmer as the age of the democratic revolution. And here is Charles Tilley's pithy summary of the changes that created the modern state. Here's how he puts it. Over the last thousand years, European states, but a lot of what he says applies to modern states in general, have undergone a peculiar evolution from wasps to locomotives. Long they concentrated on war, leaving most activities to other organizations, just so long as those organizations yielded tribute at appropriate intervals. Tribute-taking states remained fierce but light in weight by comparison with their bulky successors. They stung but they didn't suck dry. As time went on, states, even the capital-intensive varieties, took on activities, powers and commitments whose very support constrained them. These locomotives ran on the rails of sustenance from the civilian population and maintenance by a civilian staff. Off the rails, the warlike engines could not run at all. In short, modern states have to be in some sense democratic. They have to work with their populations because of the extreme complexity of the societies they, they rule. Industrialization has also, on the other hand, magnified the coercive power of states. So here's a paradox. On the one hand, modern states have to be more democratic. They have to work more closely with their citizens. They have to gain support from below. On the other hand, they can also coerce more effectively. They have more ability to support what we called earlier power from above. And this is largely because modern, modern industry has magnified the military power of states. It's enabled them to transport soldiers and weapon, weapons larger distances and it's increased the destructiveness of weaponry. This increased military power was apparent in the astonishing speed with which in the late 19th century governments from the new Atlantic hub region conquered much of Africa, Asia and the Americas. Now I'd like to talk briefly about changes in another area of life, cultural life and lifeways. The changes we've looked at, we've looked primarily at their economic aspects and now the political aspects, but they also transformed cultural life and popular lifeways. And here are some of the transformations. Everywhere, peasants slowly turned into wage earners as they were squeezed off the land by increasingly efficient commercial farmers. Now, we have to remind ourselves that this too is a fundamental change in the life ways of a majority of people on earth. As wage earners seeking employment needed education more than peasants, governments began to introduce systems of mass education. For the first time, education 
which had been largely a matter for upper classes. As a peasant, you, you learn on the job, as it were. Now became a matter that states began to take seriously and began to extend to the population as a whole. So mass education began to spread, at least in part, because most wage-earning employment required at least a minimum of literacy. The earliest modern national educational systems were established early in the 19th century in Napoleonic France and Germany. So from a world in which only a tiny elite were educated, we move to a world in which the vast majority of the population has at least the rudiments of literacy. But elite culture was transformed also, and particularly by the rising significance of power, of, of science. The first industrial science labs were created in Germany in the middle of the 19th century, and that's probably the point at which science begins to play a direct role in encouraging innovation in modern, so modern society. Before that, most innovations had been the work of tinkerers, of, of mechanics who knew machines well, but weren't necessarily thinking primarily as scientists. As the economic, technological and military importance of science rose, it began to challenge traditional ways of thinking in many, many areas. It began to challenge the traditional role, for example, of ancient religious traditions in education and culture by offering new and fundamentally materialist accounts of the universe, which offered, as we've seen throughout this course, very little room for traditional deities. So the intellectual world, both of the mass of the population and of elite groups, was also transformed in the course of the Industrial Revolution. Now I'd like, like to look at some of the negative sides. It may seem as if I, I've, I've been telling a, 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 a totally positive story, as if this is, everything is, 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 is going wonderfully. There's a profoundly negative side to all of that, uh, all of this, and that, that is the destruction of traditional societies. Growth in industrialising regions was accompanied by sometimes catastrophic decline elsewhere. As productivity rose in the new hub regions, regional differences in wealth and power widened. We've seen that the once awesome power of ancient tribute-taking empires evaporated. China's share of global production fell from 33% in 1800 to 6% in 1900. And in the 1840s, British gunboats forced China to trade in opium with the remarkably hypocritical argument that they were defending free trade. And China, one of the great empires of the past, of the past was forced to submit to hum humiliating controls on its foreign trade imposed by these small nations from the other side of the world. By 1900, states from the new hub regions of the Atlantic zone dominated much of the world, directly or indirectly. This transformation depended in part on new industrial weaponry. The first successful machine gun, the Gatling gun, was used in the later stages of the American Civil War. It could fire 1,000 rounds a minute. The Maxim gun, the first machine gun to use a belt feed, was invented in 1884. It was used by British troops in the Matabili War in 1893-4 in modern Zimbabwe, and it gave British troops a devastating and horrifying advantage over their spear-carrying opponents. Hilaire Belloc wrote at the time with, with vicious irony, whatever happens, we have got the Maxim gun, and they have not. The vast regional differences in wealth and power that are familiar today first appeared in the late 19th century. In an important book on the origins of the Third World, which is called Late Victorian Holocausts, Mike Davis argues that in 1800, class differences within societies were generally more important than those between different regions of the world. For example, he argues, differences in living standards between a French worker and an Indian farmer were probably far less striking than those between those groups and those who ruled over them. By 1900, he argues, differences in national living standards between wealthier and poorer countries had become, for the first time in human history, as profound as differences within societies. And he concludes that the gross inequalities between different regions of the world 
that we take for granted today were, and I quote, as much modern inventions of the late Victorian world as electric lights and Maxim guns. In summary, this lecture has traced how the modern revolution spread around the world. It transformed economies, it transformed governments, and it transformed cultures. And we've also seen how rapid industrialization in some areas of the world undermined the traditional economies, lifeways and societies of other parts of the world. Would these changes continue? In the next lecture, we look at what happens in the 20th century. Thank you. Changes occurred in a large number of other sectors as well, but these are the main sectors, the ones where the changes are most striking. The cotton gin, incidentally, cotton gin or engine, was a particularly important American contribution to this phase. Invented by Eli Whitney in 1793, it was a mechanical device for separating cotton seeds from cotton fibers. Now here, in this case, we can measure the resulting increase in productivity very easily. It now took one person to do what had previously taken 50 people working by hand. Unfortunately, as with many of these innovations, the initial impact of this was simply to increase the scale of sweated labor, or in the case of the states, of slavery. Now, wave two. Wave two took place in the early 19th century. Innovation accelerated in many parts of Western Europe. Innovation continued and spread around the entire world, and it's still continuing today more than two centuries later. Now, why the difference between the outcomes of these two periods of very rapid, almost explosive growth? Partly the difference is that the world of the 19th century was so much more integrated and interconnected than the world of the 12th century. Remember, the world of the 12th century, the world of Song China, was still a world divided into four main world zones and even connections between the different parts of Eurasia, between, say, China and the Mediterranean, were slow. It took several centuries for Chinese innovations to diffuse through Eurasia. Now we look at this later industrial revolution. How rapidly did the changes we have observed during the British Industrial Revolution spread to other parts of the world? And how great was their impact? Well, the short answer is that within just two centuries it affected the period it occurred and the distinctive technologies associated with that wave. So let's begin with the first of these four waves. Wave one. The first wave begins in the late 18th century, and we described some aspects of it in the previous lecture. It mainly affected Britain. It also touched the western edge of Europe and in some senses touched even the eastern seaboard of the United States. New technologies in this wave included a much more productive agrarian sector, improved steam engines, steam engines that were now efficient enough to be taken up widely in other, other industries and therefore allowed humans to tap into the immense reserves of energy stored in fossil fuels the mechanization of cotton textile production and increased production of coal and iron. And we saw also that... Do you remember the near industrial revolution of Song China in the 11th and 12th centuries CE? We saw how in an environment that was suddenly more commercialized, more competitive than in the past, innovation suddenly increased and a huge amount of innovation occurred in agriculture, in industry, in economic organization and so on. But then what happened was that it all fell away again from the end of the 13th in the 14th centuries. What made the modern revolution so different is that instead of dying away like this, 
The process of centuries, industrialization had transformed the entire world for better or worse. No earlier transformation in human history had ever been so rapid or so far-reaching. Just remember, in the Paleolithic era, the first era of human history, it took humans almost 200,000 years to spread around the entire world. So what I, what I want to do in this lecture is to describe the impact of industrialization up to about 1900. To get a clear overview of these changes, it might help to think of four main waves of change before 1900. The real processes, of course, were much more intricate, much more complicated. But this idea of four main waves provides a very helpful, broad sketch of the main changes. So we'll, we'll, we'll survey in each of these waves the region